fun. Hi everyone, welcome to Immediate Chat, where everything, except Kirsten today, is digital. She's analog. Kirsten, how are you today? Good, how are you? I am doing well. Um, how, how's the weather? The weather here is, well, it's, uh, uh, I don't want to depress you. We're about, uh -huh. we're going to be 69, 70 degrees today. You know, we're having a wonderful, amazing, almost reaching 30 today. I think it's beach weather. You know, that's summer in Wisconsin, actually. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, hey, tell us who so, our guest is today. We've got a great guest lined up. Yeah, this is great. I, um, I, I've actually been following Jen for a while on Twitter and some other stuff, and I really like uh, a lot of what she's doing. So she has the web ahead and is a speaker and has a podcast and a bunch of things. Well, that's good. So what we've got is Jen Simmons and we're gonna, uh, with we're us gonna, today. And we're going to run our intro, and then we will bring her right on. All right, fantastic. Here we go. And we're back. And hi, Jen. How are you? Hi. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> you're more than welcome. Thanks for being here. And uh, so you're in Brooklyn. Yeah. And uh, we are in California. And um, your cohort right beneath you, she's up in <laughs> even colder Boston area. Yeah. Boston's gotten <clears throat> such bad snow. I know. Yeah, we got slammed. Luckily, I'm in I'm in Central Mass, which isn't as bad, oh, but it's yeah, yeah. still feet and feet and feet hmm. of snow. I have a lot of friends up on the North Shore, and they've gotten just the worst of it. Um, you know, times when oh, it's 12 inches here, but then it's 18 to 24 wow. inches. Yep. We're right on top of the five towns my friends are in. Yeah, so. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, where well, where I am actually was the snowiest city in the U.S. for about a week, uh. but we're no longer number one. Yay! What are you number I'm two? So we're number two now. <laughs> Who's number one? Um, somewhere else in Massachusetts. Huh. Wow. Somewhere else in Mass. <clears throat> it's it's amazing. Yeah, but when this happens, so, property values plummet. You do know that, right? Yeah, well, They all come know, to California. That's how it goes. <clears throat> all Florida. right, so Jen, you, um, I'm, I'm looking at your Twitter page right now. Web designer yeah. who codes, host and executive producer of the Web Ahead podcast. Yeah. How long have you been doing that podcast? I started in, I think it was October or September of 2001, so a year, no, I'm sorry, three and a half years or so. 2001 yeah. or 2011? No, I'm sorry, gosh, 2011. Okay, good, <laughs> I was going to say, I was like, 2001, wow. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, that was more than three years ago. Um, yeah, 2011. Fantastic. The one with the so one. What, what got you into it? What, what made you decide you wanted to do a podcast? Um, I had been invited to be on another podcast, and I had met Dan Benjamin when I was on that mm -hmm. show, and he invited me to do to co-host a show that we did together for uh, about six weeks called The Daily Edition. It was every day, actually. Um, wow. And I had such a great time doing that show. When Dan decided to retire it, uh, he asked me if I wanted to do another show. And I said, absolutely, I do. Um, and he was like, what do you want to do it on? And I said, oh, HTML5. <laughs> uh, and he was like, no one's going to listen to a show about HTML5. I'm like, yes, they, they will. They, I won't call it the HTML5 show. I'll call it something else. But um, yeah, so I started the web ahead. So now I know where I've seen you before. Aside from the podcast, it's the Dan Benjamin connection. Yes. It, yes. Yeah, the Daily Edition was really great fun. And it, because it was an hour and because it was every day, it was a great way to kind of just get thrown in. And, and yeah, it wasn't so nervous, you know, after you do something for a while, you really aren't that nervous anymore. And there wasn't any time to prepare. It was a lot of just right. like on the fly kind but of But that work. was fun. I remember seeing the show and, you know, I kept going, I know her. Where do I know her from? I'm bad at, I'm bad at names, but I remember the face. I go, I, do, I, do, I know you. Um, <clears throat> and Dan does good podcasts. He's got you know, really the whole good. channel going and uh, so that's good. And he just he just started a new show yesterday called the Dan Benjamin Hour, which is basically the Daily Edition revived. Oh, with, interesting. Um, with Hattie Cook instead of with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. And and of course different because it's now four almost four years later. Yeah. But yeah. So what got you? How you've been in web web design for for a long time? Yeah. So yeah. Tell me about I, I it. Uh, yeah, I started around ninety six. Uh, 
I guess getting online around 96 and messing around with web code and, you know, just seeing what's possible. I was doing a lot of uh, graphic design at the time, uh, although we didn't call it that then. It was called desktop publishing. And uh, so I was used to using, uh, I guess it was, was it Cork at the time or still PageMaker, but that kind of software a lot, Photoshop, those Mm -hmm. things. Um, And the web felt like a natural extension of that kind of work. I was working for a nonprofit arts organization, and we did a lot of theater, a lot of film festivals, a lot of music concerts, and such. And um, so, I, I, the very first website I built was for that nonprofit to promote our work and to, uh, you know, have a website. Now, Jen, it sounds like you get down to the code level. Yeah, I've always written code because in, back in the day, that's what it meant, you know. T- uh, and I, as a designer, I first designed for theater originally. <laughs> um, Part of, to me, part of really knowing how to design something well and to do to do great design is to understand the tools at a very deep level. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, as a lighting designer, you, you know, you start out as an electrician and you hopefully work your way up to where you're just telling all the other electricians what to do. You don't have to actually wire things together yourself, or you're a set designer and you're involved with the construction, but maybe overseeing it at a certain point. You're not actually the one whipping out a hammer and a drill. Um, But to me, those things were always intimately connected, designing and building things. So So, so you were a light designer at one point. Yeah, I did lighting design and I did set design and uh, later some sound design and even later than that, uh, video projection design. That's very cool. And you know, light design, tell us a little bit about light design. It's not that easy. Yeah, and I was never, I mean, I didn't work on Broadway or anything. I was never, um, you know, it was a lot of... uh, community theater kinds of things because I was in Texas at the time. There's not a, there's not a big professional theater scene in Texas. Um, but we, you know, so we had equipment, but not necessarily a lot of equipment. I mean, some of the houses I worked in when I was younger up in Boston were much better equipped. Mm. Um, but the, I didn't, I wasn't a designer then. I was an electrician and a carpenter. Um, but the, I mean, it's really, I've loved designing in light and I feel like video projection design was an extension of that where, mm-hmm. um, because you're also designing in light, you're just designing with pixels that can move very quickly, driven by computers rather than shafts of light driven by um, things that were not computerized, although later they were. But it, it, it's just a beautiful, I mean, you're creating beauty or you're creating, you're setting a tone, you're setting a mood, you're shaping an emotional experience for people. Um, as something's happening on stage, you're kind of underlining it or you're heightening it or you're... There's a lot of um, motion in it, even if the lights themselves don't move. There's a lot of just the f- when you create a lighting cue, the way it transitions mm-hmm. from black into light or from one set of lights to another set of lights, the speed at which you run that transition. And the, there's a way in which you can really underline the kind of energy that's happening in a live space and a live performance. Um, Your background is really broad. You have, you've taught digital filmmaking photography yeah. um yeah. game development yeah there was a couple of years i was working uh, i've done a lot of teaching and there were two years that i did it the, that's the only job i had full-time teaching um high school age students outside of the school system and so we were doing um again not you know super this is not hollywood filmmaking but we were doing um digital projects with we had a computer lab and a bunch of students who'd show up every every day and we'd hang out and be like what do you want to make and they'd say oh i want to make i love video games i want to make a video game we'd be like all right i'm going to teach you flash let's do some really basic video game kinds of uh you know what kind of story do you want to tell what kind of oh you want to do the drawings all right do these drawings now you're going to scan them in here's how to use a scanner here's how to animate things here's how to um so that on that level, yeah, yeah, it's really, and, and in some ways it's really all connected. You know, once you begin to become a master of digital and a master of manipulating images and motion and pixels and sounds, uh, words, and figuring out how to shape them into an experience for people or into a story, um, how to really create a story in this kind of soup of digital stuff um in some ways the different mediums are very much related this is what i find interesting in the, you're the i think 15th guest where mm-hmm. you're in digital and it's about storytelling which i think is mm-hmm. the, the underlying core i think that's the strong truth how uh, for people who are not in the field can you explain why storytelling is such a powerful part of it 
Um, I mean, storytelling is just is powerful, period. It, it, it always has been. It's not easy to do. It's not, um, you know, it's not, I think the last 100, 150 years of humanity, we've lived in this world where professionals are the people who are storytellers. You have a professional filmmaker, a professional comedian, a professional um, actor. And, but it wasn't always that way. I mean, it used to be where it was just a nor- normal, natural part of being a human being. You'd sit around with your family in the evenings and tell each other stories or, I don't know what, something. <laughs> um, and, it, and it was in the sort of modern age of, of once film filmmaking got invented and t- later radio and then even later television, that's when things sort of became an industry and, and this mass consumption, many to one, one person making something or one team making something and then millions of people consuming it. Um, that's the world that- we live in now. Although with digital, with, you know, with the internet, things sort of went back the other way where it becomes much more, you know, everybody can make a video and put it on YouTube. Everybody can s- snap a f- photo with your phone and post it to Facebook or Instagram or wherever and have potentially hundreds of thousands of people um, see what you've made. And I think, Jen, one of the things that, that has changed, and, and that's partly because, like you said, the professionals have taken it over, which takes a lot of the emotion out of it, is a lot of the stories aren't in context. So the narrative is being controlled by someone who has maybe an ulterior plan for the narrative, uh, whether it's advertising or commercials, whatever it might be, versus the actual story. So you've got a lot of stuff that's out of context with, with, a, with a, a narrative that may not relate to a lot of people. And I think that's what we've lost, that context, the narrative. Like you said, we used to have you know, maybe multiple generations living together. You look, you have one generation living together right now. So it's a, it's a different world, and we've lost something that was pretty valuable, that storytelling that went from generation to generation to generation, which, which transferred knowledge. Mm-hmm. Now you just go to you know, YouTube or Google or whatever else and get your knowledge piecemeal, but it's different. Yeah, and I, I'm not enough of a historian to really be able to tell an accurate picture of what's happened. I, I think... There are a lot of people I've known who get very sentimental and very kind of, they feel like something's, something very bad has happened that we used to have a kind of community and, um, or at least if you just specifically think about storytelling and art, that somehow, you know, there used to be art and now there is no art mm-hmm. or art used to be kind of high and valued and now our society doesn't value art. And I think in many ways that is true, especially in the U.S. or in, in Western culture where we don't put enough money, our economy is not, um, you know, it's hard to be an artist. It's hard to make sort of authentic work well, without what, putting what, a business model behind it or without figuring out how am I, I going to support this with advertising. And, and um, Jen, you live in New York, so you know, I grew up in New York. Yeah. I think a lot of that has to do with how fast we're all moving. Yeah. And, and I do, I do think though that there is, there's, it's changing, but there is an upside as well, mm-hmm. and that there is the possibility for anyone to grab an iPad and make something, make a drawing, sure. make, you know, it's very easy to make things. It's very easy to make a movie these days. It might not be, probably not going to be very good. It's probably going to be a pretty bad movie, but I think it's pretty. I think it's cool. It's much. I think it's very. I think there's something about the 21st century that's pretty amazing, mm-hmm. and that you can have a phone and a kid and the kid can use the phone to make a little movie and their experience of movies is not just watching them or paying money to go to a theater to watch Mm -hmm. them but it is in fact making them as well I I think there's something pretty great about that I want to shift the conversation a little to Mm -hmm. your responsive design work Um, you help customers, you help clients kind of change their relationship to the web in a pretty drastic way, don't you? Yeah, I really love doing layout design and responsive layout design. And I've found um, there's something about using media queries to change the shape of the content on the page and move things around um, based on the screen size that I think is more authentic to what the web actually is as a medium. I think I think those fixed with the websites that we all made for so long are really... Uh, we thought the web was print and we were trying to make paper on the web and there's something about responsive design that I think is more inherent to the actual 
medium itself and anything I, it excites me as I watch the medium mature and I see us begin to, to discover as a community as everyone sort of together discover like what really is inherent to this medium and responsive design I think is is that I think it's much more authentic and there's some kind of a puzzle and maybe it's because I I you know going back to lighting design or or theater design you're designing over time in theater and there's something about designing across a wide range of screen sizes that is similar to me. And it, there's something there's something very dynamic there in figuring out, okay, at this width, let's put things in this here, here, and here. And at that width, let's put them here, 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 and there. Um, and it disappoints me when I see a lot of folks sort of phoning that in. There, there's a lot of templates or a lot of, I don't know, frameworks yeah. pre-made systems that people think you're supposed to use that uh are i don't know they've got like a one main column content and a, a sidebar and and they just put the sidebar at the bottom of the main content on those narrower screens um a lot of the early responsive design was those kinds of things i think we're we are going through another phase right now where everything's just one main column down the middle of the page with an equal sized mm-hmm. margin on each side mm-hmm. and there's not a lot else going on you know or there's a hero graphic that goes across the top really big there's a couple horizontal lines of some bands of color to sort of break up the page into into sections but mm, there's so much more that's possible there's so much more that we could be doing when it comes to figuring out where things go on the page and how things move from one place on the page to another at different screen sizes. Um, and I, I, I messed around with that a lot with this uh, website that I just launched for the show that I do, The Web Ahead, where, uh, for example, on the episode page, there's the content on that page. There's, there's the title and the episode number and the description of the show, a list of what happens in that show, the player, the bio of the guest, a photo of them, their name, um, Maybe a big pull quote for that show, maybe a transcript for that show, but not every show. Uh, the show notes, some related content. Like, there's all these different chunks of content, and the way that they move around on the page and the places that they go from screen size to screen size. Um, I really enjoy messing around with that and figuring out how to do a great design at every break point. Um, now, what I'm, to, uh, what I'm actually I'm showing sorry. your website right now on my screen. Oh, good. Oh, cool. So here, let me just move that. Yeah, over the about a page bit. is really boring. But if you go to an episode page, yeah. this page is especially there we boring. Go. Now, Jen, what tool do you use to create your website? Um, this particular website is running on Drupal, mm-hmm. uh, and I use HTML and CSS to design. Okay. Um, I really wouldn't know how to do the kind of designs that I do in Photoshop. It would be, it would take forever. It would just be unreasonably Oops. complex. My browser is fighting back right now and saying, I won't resize. I refuse. Oh, no. Let me try that again. There we go. There we yeah. go. Tweak that Well, and if bit. you go to, like, you know, yeah, uh, if you go to an episode page. There we go. Click, yeah, click on the title of that episode um, where it says, yeah, and there then you, you can Reinventing. see the episode page. I think the episode page is most dynamic. It's the most important page on the site, so it was the one I was able to spend the most time doing something creative with. Yeah, this is great because you actually have, you know, a nice, you can play it right here, open it in iTunes. I really love this, by the way. Thank you. Read the transcript. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, we've had, me had a really great team of people helping out with the transcripts and making it possible to do them. So I'm very appreciative to them. Are you automating the transcripts or are people actually no, doing it by hand? No, they're typing, typing by hand. Really? Oh, Jen wow. Schlick is transcribing the episode. She's done a lot of them, yeah. We've done about half of the back catalog um, I've got 97, 96 shows at this point, and we, I think over 50 have been transcribed. Um, and I'm other, you know, I'm looking for other volunteers to help out and transcribe the, the, especially the early shows. We did a series about web history, Eric Meyer and I did. Um, so mm-hmm. I'm especially interested in getting all of those transcribed. Um, or at some point I may have the funding if I get a sponsor, somebody wants to sponsor and help, help with the transcriptions, it'd be great. So what's yeah. the big trend you're seeing in the web right now in web design as well as, you know, where the web's going? Um, 
there's a lot of trends, right? So one of the ones that I don't like is it feels like there's a big trend among programmers, or I should say maybe engineers, especially back-end engineers, to be getting on the web, and they're trying to make the web into something that I don't think that it is, which is a, a runtime environment for a, a single programming language. So there's a bit of a fight going on right now with a lot of folks wanting to use JavaScript uh, frameworks, and... Mm -hmm. They want to ignore accessibility. They want to ignore HTML. They want to ignore web standards. And they, there, there's this, just this push to act like a web browser is simply a frame for running their application. Hmm. And they want yeah. to write their application as if it's Java or Turbo Pascal or <laughs> Perl or and P, you know PHP or something. And doesn't it, that feel like that they just went back in time? Because my first experiences with the web were crowbarring people out of the mindset <laughs> of of like full flash pages or pages that were yeah. completely inflexible. And accessibility yeah. is a big thing for me. So it feels like that that is really just stepping back 10, 15 years in time. Yeah, and I think it's sort of confusing and frustrating for a lot of us who have been around forever and remember the days when you had to decide are we going to make this website for Internet Explorer or for Netscape mm -hmm. because yeah. we can only do one we have to choose and then we're going to put a big banner on the homepage that tells people which browser they're supposed to use yeah. yep. and then they're going to use that one browser right we learned all these lessons already so why are we suddenly oh because we're all old <laughs> 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 and so well, babies got born and now they're <laughs> adults and they're coming in fresh and they've been doing this for like four years and they yeah. weren't around in the days of of the browser wars back in 96 98 and they don't remember the lessons that we learned of what's really wrong with flash that we the pain we went through in 2000 2002 2005 right uh, yeah. You and know, so those, they, that was the years of all, you know, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, that was the famous German Flash websites. Oh, my Everything God. was German, big, yeah. huge kaleidoscopes of, of color and animation. They were fun. They, they had no purpose, really, but they were fun. Well, and and I loved Flash when it came out. Yeah. I thought it was the greatest thing ever because mm -hmm. you didn't have to worry about different browsers and compatibility. Right. And you could do animation, and you could put things on the page, and they would stay exactly where you put them. Mm -hmm. Yep. But... That I wanted to maintain those websites and I wanted to update those websites right. and it was completely impractical right. because it, it took work. way too long. And then I realized that, oh, this computer doesn't have the latest version of Flash, so it just, just doesn't run my website at all. Like, yeah. this entire university has the older version of Flash running. And so I walk in and no one can look at my website. Like, oh, and it's completely inaccessible and it's this black box and it doesn't work at all and it's not going to get archived on the web, archive.org. And it's, you know, like, it's, and then, oh, the iPhone came out and that was the, that was the last straw. But it, that's not the only reason that we, we realize that Flash is a bad idea. Um, no, no, it's, that, it's that all or nothing idea. It's this yeah. idea that, you know, we don't care about the web. The web is stupid. We just care about running an application, mm -hmm. and we're going to pretend that the web is a runtime environment for my application, and I'm going to write my code the way I want to write it. Like, that's not what the web is. It's not. It's not. You know, this, the web is this amazing other thing that has these incredible strengths and is able to go onto an insane number of devices that are completely crazy different from each other. You haven't even heard of half of them, yep. and you don't have to worry about it because if you code your website with progressive enhancement with web standards valuing the markup that is on your html you know, your html markup that's around your content you pay attention to semantics you start with good accessible semantic html and you layer on things you layer on a look with css you layer on behavior with javascript if you write things in that way then your website will last. It mm -hmm. will last 20 yeah. years. It will ex it will last when people put it in Instapaper or they use some sort of read it later functionality. It will last when it ends up uh, in an RSS feed. It will last. Like it will it will it will keep going. Your future you proofing it. Yeah, when you forget yeah. the semicolon in your JavaScript or you you know somebody <laughs> reconfigures the server and some sort of error is getting thrown, your website will still run. It won't yeah, I have break. I have a, a quick story for you on that. I was showing actually Eric Myers uh, and Jeff Seltman's books in a in a web class, and I brought people to RISD's website, the Rhode Island yeah. School of Design. Yeah. And this was 10, 12 years ago. They had an entirely flash front page where you had to chase the navigation with your mouse. 
I remember those. <laughs> and I remember every single class going apoplectic and saying, for the love of God, never <coughs> do this. And I, I, I love Flash. Yeah. I mean, Angry Birds is Flash. I love it. I think it's great. But that was just offensive, actually. It was form before function. Well, it was also, you're chasing the navigation with your mouse. You're giving people an ocular motor and physical skills test to use your bloody website. <laughs> Excuse the hell out of me. Hey, I've got another complaint. You know. Now, you mentioned earlier <laughs> accessibility. And, and I, I would venture to say, and I've read this article in a couple places, accessibility forums and things like that, that 80% of the websites today are almost unreadable to most people. A very light, you know, 5% gray on mm. pure white or, or light blue on pure white. Those are hard colors for the eyes, especially as you get older. Um, what do you think is happening in that world where people are designing websites that a lot of people can't read? Yeah, I mean, I hope that we're learning these lessons. I think there's always a debate, uh, best practices, evangelizing mm -hmm. best practices, and um, making sure that everything's big enough and contrast is high enough and, right. and really learning all the different things to think about when it comes to accessibility. Now, what do you think of dark versus light websites? That's another We We have a dark website, for example. Half yeah. the people love it, half the people hate it. I go, now we did, that, we did that for the mobile reason because dark websites are much easier to read on a small device. You think? I think. Well, well sometimes. Rick has, <laughs> keep in mind that Rick, Rick also has, uh, Rick, you're very, you have a seeing eye wife because That's your true. eyes That's true. Yeah, I don't see that well. well. But, but regardless <laughs> of that, I do know a lot of people are going, oh my God, these things are hard to read. Yeah, uh, I personally have a, I have a very hard time reading white text on a black background. And uh, okay. it's easier when it's sort of gray text on a gray, right, dark right. gray background. Mm -hmm. But that bol that white on black, especially is super Yeah, black I don't think is harsh. a good one. But, but what yeah, about but, a dark blue or a but bluish? Even, even almost white on a pretty dark charcoal gray background, I can't, I can't read it. Yeah, so, interesting. And I think that's true for a lot of people. Um, I've never been a fan. I've always... I also think that there's something around... Um, you know, oh, it's a computer. It needs to look like a computer. This is what the computer <laughs> people do. That that used to be very popular, and it used to make me kind of mad because I think it feeds into that stereotype of, uh, you know, well, this is what a person who knows how to use a computer looks like. They're this kind of person. Yeah. They they have this personality, and they like these things, and they want this thing, and and so um. Now we even I haven't seen that in a long time. I feel like that's faded because, of course, at this point, it feels like. We now understand that the web is for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, we don't act yeah, like I, it all, all the oh, time, sorry. but at least we're sort of assuming that it is. I really hope I hope that 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 web is it for everybody actually is being picked up because yeah. I know that I believe that you believe that Rick believes that. I do encounter people who still don't understand that designing for one device is missing the entire point. Yeah, or for one country. Yeah. Or, yeah. For one, or for one demographic, or for one... Yeah. I mean, that's the amazing thing about the web. I, I wrote a... I did a presentation last year, in the year before, about um, about HTML, about the web, how it got invented, when it got invented, and about... Uh, I put in some things about um, hypertext, and what was happening in hypertext, and about the internet itself before the web. Um, and I was doing a lot of research for that talk, and it was just fascinating to kind of put myself back into that world and realize it, the web was really a miracle. And it came out mm -hmm. of a time when there were a lot of things happening when it came to hypertext and when it came to the Internet. A lot of different competing ideas about how to use these tools, um, what hypertext could look like, how it would work, what a hypertext system would, would be like. Uh, and... The web won because it's so incredibly robust and flexible because it could end up on a, a wide variety of devices. And believe me, back in like the late 80s and the early 90s, computers were very much different, way different, more different from each other than they are now, right? Like we talk about how it's so crazy we have so many devices, but basically they all run a version of Linux, uh, you, you know, Mac OS or Android. It's all Linux Mm -hmm. If you deep, if you dig mm -hmm. deep enough, it's all the same operating system, um, and they're all very, very, very similar. I mean, everybody's using the same chips. They're all using the Intel chips. They're all using right. But if you go back in time, the computers were actually much different. The further back you go, the more different that mm -hmm. they than they were from each other, um, and the harder it was to get them to communicate with each other. And 
And the web was born in that era. It was born in an era where it was a big deal to get this, you know, IBM 286 that would run DOS and nothing else to communicate with, you know, an Apple II. Jen, you um, actually remember yeah. the IBM DOS 286. I do. Wow. She was like, five. My you were like two years old then, right? <laughs> no, my life was my life. There was a moment in my life where I stood in a computer store with my father and a colleague of his from work, <laughs> and we bought a, we picked out a computer for me, and I almost almost went home with a, with a, I think it was the 286. It might have been the 386, and we were debating AT or XT. Right. And instead, <laughs> I went home with a Macintosh SE. Huh. Changed my life. Wow. So you, I'm going to transition this again. You are speaking at a lot of places, but um, event, uh, an event apart, you're speaking at two of them, actually. Yes, I'm speaking at an event apart in Seattle and an event apart in San Diego. And I hope to later in the year as well. They haven't set the schedule for later in the year. Um, so if people are interested, I'm doing a talk about layouts and about uh, uh, really looking at I can't believe I do it, but it, it's fascinating looking at magazines and saying, mm -hmm. okay, for decades we've been saying the web is not print, stop looking at print, but how about it? let's go look at print <laughs> because magazine layouts are actually very interesting and very innovative, and I think there's a lot of things that we could look, we could look back at magazines to get ideas around layout. Now, do you, like, do you like Zinio where they do all, they digitize all the magazines, and I, I love Zinio, but... Um, yeah. And they take, they have hundreds, if not thousands, of magazines that are now 100% digital, and they look great. They almost look better than the print ones. Huh. Um, they're really, really nice. All the layouts you get in print, you're getting now on, um, and they have some little features like you could just show the text on, on a magazine, not the graphics. You could combine the pages. It, it's kind of fun, yeah. and you can read it anywhere. You don't have to carry a whole mess of magazines when you're traveling, or <laughs> books for that matter. Um, digital I'll is fun that, that way. I'll check it out. Well, and I'm a big, I mean, I don't think that we should, you know, the folks at Condé Nast should figure out how to put their magazines directly onto the web in PDF form or anything. I'm, no, it's the web. You, we don't want to copy things over. We want to translate them and, and transform them and just take some hints. But, uh, but I look at things like how text wraps around shapes in, uh, on magazines, and we've not been able to do that on the web but now we can with the CSS Shapes module, the new stuff that's out. So like on the Web Ahead website, you can look, if you look at any of the guests, all the photos of the guests are in circles, and you look at um, the bio for the guest wraps around. You can't, It doesn't work in Firefox or Safari. I mean, uh, in uh, yeah, it doesn't work in Firefox but it, or IE, but it does work at this point in Safari and well, Chrome. Does anything work in Internet Explorer? I mean, I have to yeah, say. Yeah, I, no, IE... Um, I use actually pretty honestly the one that's behind the most often these days is Firefox. Yeah, it's interesting. Now you know the new yeah. IE is actually uh, what is it IE eleven I think or twelve? IE, it's actually not IE bad. ten. I mean, I was hearing things from folks at Microsoft b while IE eight and IE nine were the current version, and I was like, yeah, right. And then IE ten came out, and I was like, oh, they actually meant it. They really I, the the team over at Internet Explorer. Business leadership made decisions. Something happened. They changed their plans, and they embraced web standards. They fully embraced web standards, and so they've been working very hard with IE10 to bring it up to speed. And then also with IE11, and now with Spartan, they're basically they ripped out a lot of the old rendering engines crap out of all the legacy code, all the legacy from IE5, six whatever, whatever. They've ripped that all out and they're releasing their new browser with uh, Windows 10 will be called, well, it's codenamed Spartan. I don't know what the eventual name will be. Um, but cool. I had somebody from Microsoft, Ray Bango, came on to the web ahead. I think it's episode 94. Yeah, episode 94. Um, and he explained the whole thing because I was like, okay, Ray Bango, what's going on? <laughs> what do you mean? They're getting rid of Internet Explorer. They're killing Internet Explorer off? Like, okay, maybe killing is the wrong word. But they're, they've, they've morphed it into... A product that's so different that they're changing the name of it. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really surprised actually that Firefox is is as laggy as it is with with behavior. Um, because for well, example, Rick and I both faster. do Captivate. Oh, Firefox, sorry, 
Firefox has gotten way faster than it used to be. It got a reputation of being very slow for a long time, but mm-hmm. it's, they've really worked hard, the folks at Mozilla, to make the JavaScript rendering. Oh, engine. no, I'm sorry. I, I, was, I, I didn't mean speed. I actually meant, um, I meant, you know, which one is more current on web standards. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think my sense is that Mozilla focused so much on JavaScript and on, uh, especially when it comes to things like getting the web to a place or getting Firefox to a place where it could run a phone operating system and they were focusing a lot on games for a while. They really loved the idea of playing games in browsers and they wanted that to be fast in Firefox. Um, I think they got a little behind on paying attention to just good old fashioned CSS and the innovations that are happening right now in CSS. So they were the last people to, the last browser to implement Flexbox fully. They're the last browser, they haven't even, I don't know what they're even doing when it comes to CSS shapes or exclusions or um, grid layout or some of the other layout innovations that are coming. I hope, my hope, I've heard some things that maybe they've, you know, they've shifted priorities again. So my hope is that they'll catch back right up quick. But um, it is, it has been weird the last year or two to be like, this new thing is out. It's awesome, except it doesn't work in Firefox. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I like I, I actually had totally that experience with a class. It. Rick and I both uh, use Captivate, and I had to explain to folks that if you preview your work in Firefox, it's going to pop up a browser warning, and if you preview it in anything else, it won't. Hmm. Yeah, but and you could disable that warning. You can disable <clears throat> it, but the thing is, for the stuff I was developing, the browser warning actually doesn't. It's nonsensical because it's not true. Hmm. It's just there because it's Firefox and it's Captivate being unhappy with each other. Huh. Um, so you do have to disable it, but the it actually isn't there for, in my case, for a functional purpose because there's not actually anything that won't run. Did you submit a bug? Um, no, they know about it. You, they Basically, yeah. there's a specific JavaScript trick you're supposed to do to turn the warning off for Firefox. Uh-huh. And the official narrative between Adobe and Firefox seems to be it's their problem. They need to fix it first. Mm. So You know, it's funny. I find more issues with Chrome and e-learning than I do with Firefox. Inter- but that's e- e-learning only. Yeah, well, I so- mean, some of these proprietary things I, I don't feel as strongly about because mm-hmm. if there's some sort of I don't know, third-party library or something that's getting built right. that doesn't have full compatibility, then I, I don't know. There's a, lo- there's a longer, I mean, you know, it's a sort of a wormhole of stuff to get into. Mm-hmm. But when yeah. it comes to CSS shapes level one specification approved and stamped and ready to go, W3C web standards, like that, I expect the browser makers to get on board. And when mm-hmm. I see them putting priorities someplace else... Um, and I don't just, I'm not just thinking of Mozilla. I mean, I'm also thinking of, of Chrome and Google. I mean, they also have their own ideas. Everybody's got their own plan about what's important to them uh, and, and why they want to focus on one thing instead of another. Because resources are limited. You can't build everything at once. Yeah. Um, so, I, but I hope, I mean, I'm very excited about Shapes. And the great thing about Shapes is that, and you can see it on the web ahead, like, uh, it's a one line of CSS to make the text wrap in a circle. And mm-hmm. if that, if the browser doesn't know what that one line means, it ignores it, which is the beauty of how the web works. It doesn't freak out. It still renders the page. It just ignores that one line of CSS. And what you get instead is a square. I mean, the, the text just goes into a square, um, which is fine. It's it's just the way you might expect if you were only browsing the web in Firefox already. Like, or, you know, yep. it's it's not a problem to have that kind of a fallback. Or IE, I guess IE 11 is the same way. Definitely IE 10 is the same way. I have to, I should look up. Now, Jen, do you have a favorite browser, one that you like a little bit more or just is more compatible with what you do? You know, I Firefox would be up there and Fi- Safari as well. I use all of them. Uh, I Chrome is clearly the favorite among web designers and developers. I, when I launched the site for the web ahead, I, now I have access to stats to see who it is, you know, what browsers are people using to um, surf the site. And I was surprised. I'm going to write up a blog post and put the actual numbers in, in it. But huge numbers when it came to iOS, Safari. Okay. Hardly anybody on Android. I was like, really? <laughs> and then when it comes to desktop browsers... Chrome just dominates, dominates over everybody else. So really, Chrome's beating everybody. <laughs> yeah, among the kind of like tech industry folks. And that right. surprises me a lot because, you know, Chrome is part of Google's ecosystem and the whole 
business plan around Google's ecosystem is to watch you as much as possible and to scrape as much information about you uh-huh. and your life and your demographics <clears throat> and what, what advertising they might be able to deliver to you mm-hmm. f- to make money. And I'm actually surprised that more nerds don't refuse to use Chrome for that reason. Um, I don't use Chrome because I don't want... That same here. Mm-hmm. I don't want all that information being gathered yeah. about what I do. Well, you know, I use it for testing. I use it for because I, when I need Flash, I use it because I don't have Flash installed. Well, you know, it's really, OS, it's, but it's really funny because a lot of the, I, I think the biggest threat to the internet is probably every government on earth because they don't like the internet because they can't control mm-hmm. people and what they say the way they want. It doesn't matter if you're right, left, in between, up, down. They yeah. all want some control. And we've had about, I don't know, six attempts already in the U.S. to pretty much control it under BS regulations that have nothing to do with the actual Internet. And it's scary because whatever parties in power at whatever time think that they're the only one who's going to benefit from it. And then the next power, you know, whatever party's in charge is going to abuse it somehow or other. And it's just, that's what I see scary. And there's a lot of dictators around the world that want the Internet banned totally. And so there's a lot of collusion going on that's, that's unhealthy, if you will. Yeah. That's what scares me the most about yeah. the internet. That's why they keep saying system administrators will save the world one day, hopefully. So. Well, I no, I think it's a problem. I think we need to talk about it much mm-hmm. more about yeah. the NSA and about what's yeah. happening and all this data that's being gathered. I see some designers being all excited, like, "Oh, design with data, and you should mm. definitely blah blah." And I'm like, yeah. "Why aren't we not talking about this more?" It's sounding alarm bells, like this. Is, I it's think this scary. Is a I, th- I think it's a it's a bad. You know, we could be at 1984. We've already passed 1984, yeah. but the next one could be a lot worse. And um, yeah. I just I just worry about it because I see, you know, power corrupts no matter who's got it. And yeah. uh, the Internet's something everybody wants. And no, it's I, beautiful I the reading, way it is. I was reading an article yesterday. Um, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, I don't mind if the NSA watches me because I'm not doing anything bad. You know, it's not a problem. And I'm thinking... Your idea of what's considered bad Mm -hmm. is super naive because they aren't necessarily talking about stopping someone who wants to commit mass murder. They're talking about stopping people who are doing things that they don't like. Right. And it's it's not just, (coughs) oh, the government's so evil. It's more like, no, the powers that be will be tempted by the amount of power they have to mm-hmm. wield that power to get what they want. And I don't know that the government is really the most powerful thing. I think it's corporations that are more powerful, and they True. are increasingly controlling the government. And increasingly, I don't know that we can necessarily understand where one stops and where the other begins. And there was an article, um, this article I read was talking about this jail in Chicago where people who are, in fact, U.S. citizens being swept up on U.S. soil and taken to a U.S. hosted uh, secret illegal jail, basically, Mm -hmm. a black site, and and being disappeared without lawyers, being tortured, without any kind of... And that's just... It just violates the Constitution in so many ways. Well, well, yeah, a lot of things do. And and, uh, See, I I lived for three years. I lived for... I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, let me just... They were arrested for terrorism, but, Mm -hmm. but they were not committing terrorism. They were organizing protests they were organizing protests against ma- co- uh, corporations you know mm-hmm. the kind of protests that we've seen people protesting the world trade organization or people tro- protesting the republican national convention or people we've seen these protests people protesting the iraq war we've seen these protests over the last decade where people were in new york they were hauled into jails without lawyers they were actually taken at that time to these piers that were closed i mean waterfront real estate in new york mm-hmm. city that sits empty yeah. there's something seriously wrong with that real estate <laughs> that's like, probably true <laughs> no yeah. one no one is going to let massive amounts of new york waterfront real estate sit, sit empty if there isn't something incredibly expensively yeah. wrong with it and they were throwing kids into these warehouses and leaving them for two three four days no mm-hmm. lawyers no access to anybody and uh and so this is like one step worse one step worse one step worse and and i've you know i have friends who care deeply about what's happening in palestine and they've been watched by the fbi and i you know like it's just if if anyone thinks oh i'll never be that's just for you know stopping another 9-11 you, you, it's just very very naive um, well i always I, I always jokingly say hi to the cia or nsa guys who are listening when i'm talking oh, to people and say, oh, right by the way hi guys <laughs> <laughs> all right and i'm actually going to move us on to the the last thing so jen you're on twitter 
as yes. uh, Jen Simmons. Is that the main place uh, you want people to find you or yeah, your website? People can follow me on Twitter, Jen Simmons, or um, go to the webahead.net website. You can also, I have a website, jensimmons.com, where I'll have more information about the, all the conferences I'm speaking at if you want to see this talk about layouts or whatever else. And... Um, because I'll be in Toronto coming up for International Women's Day, talking about women in tech, and what else? I'm going to be uh, at the CSS, oh, the Responsive Web Design Summit online in March, where you could see the layout talk online, um, and other ones coming up. I think uh, typography conference in um, Brighton in the fall in November. Um, so. JenSimmons.com will have that information. I I almost don't usually give out that site because I. That site needs work. <laughs> okay. Well, let me show up. So but I just popped that one up, but I will works. pop over to Twitter. So there, I'm showing your Twitter. And then the Web Ahead site. Yes. There we go. So yeah, the Web Ahead dot the show. Subscribe to the show. We talk about all these kinds of things all the time. Not, not the NSA, the politics, but we talk about the web. <laughs> we talk about the web stuff all the time. So so as a wrap up, what what would you like your um your 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 final sign off to be? What your what do you think is coming up as a as a web trend or a web standard that people should be aware of? Um, again, there's so many, it's hard to know. I mean, the last show we just did was about virtual reality. There's folks at Mozilla working on some figuring out how to make a web browser work in the VR environment. Ha so you can do things like go to the Wikipedia page for Rome and look at the Roman Colosseum huh, cool. in virtual reality. Have you seen what uh, Microsoft's doing with a uh, Hollow Studio, and that's going to be coming out with Windows 10? It's pretty darn Star Trek-y. Yeah, there's some crazy stuff happening in VR. I don't yeah. know. I mean, personally, it's not the most exciting thing, but it's. I think there's so many exciting things mm -hmm. like that that uh, it's fun to sort of keep up with all the different things because you don't know which one might excite right. you the most or be the great solution for your projects, your business. Fantastic. So people should subscribe to your show. Yeah, subscribe to the, to the podcast. You can just look at, look, search for the web ahead in any podcast catalog, any application of your choice. If you like Overcast or Instacast or Apple cool. podcast app or whatever, just search for the web ahead and hit subscribe. Excellent. Excellent. Well, and, um, and you're, you know, got conferences coming up. Anything else coming up? Are you, um, no, I'm just mostly work focused on the show and focused on the conferences that are coming up. Yeah. Fantastic. That's great. And Jen, you have the dubious distinction or honor. You are the last guest we're having on this show. Really? We're actually taking yep. this show down. We're going to come out with a new show, an updated, different kind of show. <laughs> uh, so we're working on that. So this is, wow. this is fun. So we're, we're glad you could come on. And we'd love to yes. have you on again in the future when we have the new show, which will be a little bit different format, similar but different. Cool. Yeah, well, we're tweaking it because we've done time. this for two years, and we want to shift it a little bit. So we're going to play around and try something new. Yeah, we're going to make it exactly the same but different. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Exactly. Well, congrats, I guess. Congrats on. Uh, oh, thank you. On your last show, yeah, and your new beginning. I definitely go check out the web ahead too. Yeah. So, so Rick, uh, since you dropped the the uh, the bomb on that one I'll just uh, say okay folks stay tuned next week we'll come in and talk about what we're going to be doing and our new plan and we have some exciting stuff we want to play with and do and uh, and we'll be going to Hawaii next week right and yes next week we're going to come in on our Hawaii vacation Hawaiian <laughs> shirts and all and talk about how we're taking the sh two shows down and 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 wrapping them up into something brand new yeah so. it's a virtual vacation but that's okay yes it'll be good <laughs> That'll be good. So, Jen, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. And, yeah, we do want to have you back when we're when we're in the new format and playing some new stuff um, and hopefully get to see you at a conference. But really appreciate your time. Thank cool. you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All you people in the chat room, thanks for being there. And if you're watching, subscribe, though. There will be a new show coming up imminently. So yeah. have a good one, everyone. Thanks, Jen. Thanks. Kirsten. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.